On the evening of November 28, 2012, 26-year-old Emma Filipov walked off into the dark streets of Victoria, British Columbia. Despite the cold, she was barefoot. In the preceding weeks, her behavior had become more erratic, confused, and secretive. Many tried to help her, yet there has never been another confirmed sighting of Emma since she walked away from her life that night. What happened to Emma Filipov? Hello again. This is Buck Benny speaking. Uh, this is a throwback episode in a way. It's just Bob and myself again. So we've got just Bob here. But we're going to do something completely new here, which is kind of kind of cool at the same time. Uh, this uh, And Bob will help me figure this timeline out. But uh, Bob, I, I uh, thought of Bob because he likes science fiction and stuff. And I asked him if he would start doing these podcasts with me where we introduce Dimension X, X minus one, that sort of thing. And he took me up on it and it, they've gone great. I've really enjoyed them. They're, I look forward to this part of my week almost more than just about anything else. It let me get back my uh, friendship with Bob that we had through texting over the years, but not really gotten together much. And then we've included Jim and we've included uh, Matt and all these folks, but none of them could make it this week. So it's just Bob and I, but at the same time, the focus for this week was going to be a um, new YouTube uh, channel that, that Bob has started up and where they do, it's, it's, it's like an old time radio show a little bit, but it's, but it's uh, one of the old time radio shows that's built on fact, not fiction. And so his, his shows are factual and he asked me to do the narration of the thing, and I was a nervous wreck doing it. It's not, I'm comfortable doing what I'm doing right now, just talking off the top of my head. But actually reading something for a script and everything was a completely new experience for me. And I didn't realize how uh, many issues I had with it. Like the fact that I, I just think, it was one of those kids when you called on me in elementary school to read aloud to the class, I would be very uncomfortable with it. and. So I had to kind of get past my own demons to be able to pull this off. And it turned out I was, I'm fairly satisfied with it. I stumbled around a little bit, but I did all right. But Bob, can you take us back to kind of the genesis of this thing? Was it, you've been percolating, as far as I know, you've been percolating this idea for quite some time. And then it sparked you to really do it once you started appearing with me and doing my podcast intros that you said, oh, I should do this, I think. But maybe you can take us through that process of how you started this whole thing out. Yeah, a couple, couple things. So I actually was looking at my phone log. So we started doing this again. So this is the first text from you. It's July 5th. So we started me and you doing that like right around the middle, the beginning of July. Correct. So yeah, this has been really fun doing this. Uh, so in terms of like that, I've been wanting to do that. Um, YouTube channel for quite a while okay. and like our folk years or, or more than that or at months. least a couple probably somewhere from between a couple to five years every well ever since I saw bedtime stories which I really love which is a some British guys that do um, basically paranormal plus and they have all uh, custom art images but our focus is on missing people. Uh, ultimately, we want to do people that don't have a lot of media coverage. Mm -hmm. although, our, although our first case is pretty well covered. Um, yeah. Because, but I have friends that are tied to the case, so I really wanted to do it. Oh, yes. I should tell people before we continue on, we're going to chat. And then we're going we're gonna to have the link, not the link, it will actually present his uh, show that he created with me narrating. And you folks can uh, watch that. Um, I, I would say, and if you're listening to this on the podcast, um, 
I've, I don't know, I'll have told you this earlier probably because uh, I'll add a little intro, but um, I would suggest that you watch this on YouTube, which will be in the show notes here, versus list listening to it because it does work totally well as a just listening experience, but Bob will get into in a minute how he has uh, illustrations that go with it, and I think that really adds a lot to it. Um, it's a it's a interesting production that Bob's put together here. Um, anyway, so I, I just thought I'd explain that, but but back to Bob and and the genesis of it. So you've been thinking about it for two years, then you then in July you start doing the podcast with me. Um, how did that sort of make you all of a sudden decide to move on this project that you had percolating in your brain for years? I think just seeing somebody else do it, like okay. seeing you do it, like that it well, could I, be done. I, think, I mean, Bob knows me and he's like, if this idiot Daryl can pull off something like this, this is certainly something I can do. Certainly. <laughs> so. No, I don't think it was. I don't think it was that. That's completely. That's completely unfair. I, I think it was more like, oh, that's kind. Of, that's pretty cool. What yeah. he's doing. There you go. And yeah. people are out there at, and seeing this content. Yeah, yeah. And and people actually do listen to and watch stuff that you know amateurs. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't consider myself a professional. So, yeah. So yeah, that caught me well, moving. You knew a professional like myself to be able to come in and lend some legitimacy to your project uh, yeah yep, yeah, yeah. it wasn't an accident i picked your voice I, I you know yeah yeah well this voice boy i tell you it's, it's <laughs> money maker there <laughs> <laughs> back to you bob so tell me about the illustration piece how did you decide to get the illustrator and how did you proceed with that that was a hard one because I mean, I draw and stuff, but I don't, I'm not really connected to that community. I went out and just, uh, I, I went out to Seattle artists. I went out to Facebook and posted, Hey, I'm looking for an artist. I actually contacted a guy. I took his class on, um, great courses. Right. Um, he works, he's a teacher at the UW. I emailed him. He sent me a bunch of links that these, but none of those guys are interested and then Anastasia responded to Seattle artists and then she sent me to her page and I, there was something about the mood that she had that I liked. Yes. I love her. Her pictures were so better than I, when you told me you were going to have an illustrator, I was like, okay, that'll be interesting. And we'll see how that goes. And I was picturing more of a photo realistic person or something. And I was going, yeah, okay. But then when I saw them, I was like, oh my gosh, there's a mood that's presented with these. They add, if we didn't have this, I mean, if you're listening to this to this, and you don't see it, it, I mean, it'll be fine. I have a delightful voice and you'll love that. But, but you're missing a whole section of this that adds a whole other layer. And I just, I, I, I loved it. And there's how many pictures, like six? Is, is so she, yeah, she. It's a lot of work. Yeah. She's not. She's not. I think to her advantage, she and disadvantage, she hasn't. She's just about moving into digital because I kind of asked her to move right. digital to, to hopefully speed it up and make it easier for her. I think going conventional allowed her to get better faster because when I do digital, I can be sloppy. Like I have multiple layers. I can erase. I can cut and paste and ship things around. Oh, this person's wrong. I'll just grab it and shrink it down and then blend it in. She can't do any of that with paint. And she does really awesome ink work too. Uh -huh. Somewhere, she sent me a picture that she did that of a motorcycle she just inked. And I thought, wow. That On the evening of November 28th, 2012, 26-year-old Emma Philippoff walked off into the dark streets of Victoria, British Columbia. Despite the cold, she was barefoot. In the preceding weeks, her behavior had become more erratic, confused, and secretive. Many tried to help her, yet there has never been another confirmed sighting of Emma since she walked away from her life at night. What happened to Emma Philippoff?
Emma Filipov is 5 foot 5 inches tall and weighs between 90 and 110 pounds. She has dark brown hair and brown eyes. She earned a degree in photojournalism in Ontario and culinary arts in British Columbia. She loved to take long barefoot walks at night and drew and painted. A writer, Emma produced pages and pages of poetry in her journals. In brighter times, Emma would write. Becoming light, letting go of the body for the sky, nowhere to go but up, over the rainbow, heaven on earth. There was something about Emma that drew people to her. Family and friends describe Emma as friendly, cheerful, outgoing, creative, and intelligent. She loved animals and worked as a champion for marginalized people, especially the elderly and the homeless. One friend said that she was a quiet person, yet was always quick to laugh. But Emma was also extremely private. Underneath her cheerful facade was a young woman in pain. In her diaries, there were indications that Emma had been privately suffering with mental health issues since age 11. Due to her secretive and quiet nature, she kept this hidden from her friends and family. In the winter of 2011, a childhood friend of Emma became concerned when she found Emma outside in a euphoric state, high on grass and stars. She contacted Emma's father, who offered to fly Emma home, but Emma, stubborn and independent, refused. The same friend described Emma taking walks for as long as eight hours. Her friend went with her once and found Emma traveling through the suburbs of Victoria. Emma would spread the leaves that people had raked up in their yards. This, Emma said, would help nature. It was the way Emma approached this that concerned her friend. It seemed to Emma that she had no choice in the matter. It was her duty. Again, Emma would refuse help. Emma appeared to be suffering from schizophrenia. Unfortunately, she was too independent or too deep into the illness to seek the help she so desperately needed. After Emma's parents divorced, she longed to get away from home. My parents' marriage in shambles. My father turning to me. My mother hating us both for his doing so. And me, always a good listener. Too nice to say it hurt me too. I am my mother, and I took on much of her pain and my father's. Home, the only place I cannot be. So deep beneath the skin, I cannot breathe. In 2011, when Emma was 25, she moved west from her hometown of Perth, Ontario to Vancouver Island and settled in the city of Victoria. She didn't have a job lined up or even a place to stay. She told friends that something amazing was going to happen to her. At first, things went well. By that winter, she'd secured a job as a barista and was soon living on her own. But after a few months, Emma was let go and could no longer afford her apartment, becoming homeless. She bounced around from place to place, staying with friends, living in a hotel where she had found work cleaning rooms, or sleeping on a friend's boat. When she had nowhere else to go, she sometimes slept alone in the woods. From February to November of 2012, Emma stayed part-time in the attic at the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter. She had a seasonal job at the Redfish Bluefish Eatery in the Inner Harbor, which ended in October. But both she and her managers expected her to resume come spring. In mid-November, she told friends that she was leaving Victoria and possibly heading to Salt Spring Island or Tofano, BC. She spoke at length about many plans to many people, sailing on a boat to Mexico, heading to San Juan with a man she barely knew, moving to California, moving to Costa Rica, traveling to Japan with her father, living off the grid somewhere in the woods, 
visiting an aunt in Lanceville, B.C., and surprising her family by going back home to Perth, Ontario. A couple of weeks before her disappearance, the staff of the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter observed a change in Emma's personality. She canceled dates with friends. She stopped drinking and smoking, which up until then, she had both done regularly. Her diet consisted of a little bit of fish and massive amounts of water. The shelter employees, who usually found Emma to be cheerful and friendly, began to be afraid of her. They once witnessed her frantically moving furniture across the street, complaining that the objects were too loud and were talking to her. Emma started giving her things away, which she always did before a move or other significant life change. The girl who had been a magnet for so many friends was, in her mind, alone and isolated. Haven't been able to be in touch with anyone for support because I haven't sent open communication with them. I have no friends in this city, no family, and I am, for all intents and purposes, alone and depressed. A friend, returning from a trip, saw Emma standing in the rain, by the shelter staring blankly at a murder of crows. Exhausted from jet lag and delays, she decided not to stop. She would see Emma another day. There is the promise of flight, and I lay in fear. Somehow, somewhere, sometime, fear crept in. She is missing. I am missing. Starting on November 23rd, Emma made a series of calls to her mother, Shelly Philipoff. Overwhelmed and in tears, she told Shelly that she wanted to come home. Repeatedly, Emma asked her mother to come out from Ontario and help her move, only to change her mind the next day. Each time, Shelley packed her bags, only to unpack them the following morning. Emma and Shelley spoke every day from Friday, November 23rd to Wednesday, the 28th. Shelley redialed the number on her phone's caller ID. She was shocked to discover that Sandy Merriman was the name of a woman's shelter not a friend of Emma, as she had assumed. On the morning of November 28th, Emma called her mom for the final time, telling Shelley, Don't come, Mom. Not today. But this time, Shelley kept her bag packed and got on a flight to Victoria. Emma began the day of November 28th at the Chateau Victoria Hotel. She owned a red Mazda MPV, which at one point held the promise of freedom and motion. But now the broken down van was more of a hindrance. On November 21st, she had the van towed from Souk, BC to the 700 block of Burdett Street in Victoria. She had it moved again because of parking enforcement. Finally, she left it in the parking lot of the Chateau Victoria, who threatened to have it impounded. A tearful Emma asked for one more day to move the van. They agreed. At 8.23 a.m., Emma showed up on surveillance video at the 7-Eleven at the corner of Douglas and Humboldt Streets. She used her debit card to purchase a $200 prepaid credit card. Emma had a few thousand dollars in her bank account and didn't need the prepaid visa. She had told a friend she was going to use the prepaid visa to rent a car. Julian Hua, a friend of Emma's from Perth, would see Emma at 10 a.m. He was on a bus headed to renew his medical card when he saw Emma standing on the side of the road. Julian got off the bus a few blocks early. He only saw Emma from the back and can't see her face. He decides to register for his health card, but when he finished, Emma was still there. This time, Julian stepped into the street and looked into her hoodie. Emma is wearing a light puffy coat. Her hoodie pulled over her head, and her long hair was flowing out in all directions. 
Julian asked her if she needed help, and Emma shook her head no. Julian had grown fond of Emma when he knew her in Perth, but now he decided Emma wouldn't accept assistance from anyone. He walked off. Julian would later become a suspect in Emma's disappearance. Accused in the court of social media, Julian would then withdraw from the public. In an interview he gave to the nighttime podcast with Jordan Bonaparte, he comes across in that interview as another friend of Emma's who was deeply saddened by her disappearance. At around noon that day, Emma may have visited the library where she liked to sit and read in the children's section. Afterward, Emma was seen by several people in downtown Victoria. Due to her strange behavior, she stood out like a sore thumb. At 1 p.m., Emma shuffled vacant-eyed along Pandora Street. According to a witness, she was wearing camouflage pants and a fleece jacket. Notably, she wasn't wearing a hat. Her hair looked freshly washed and she carried several white plastic bags along with her orange purse. In the early afternoon, a colleague from the Redfish Bluefish restaurant bumped into Emma near Our Place Soup Kitchen on Pandora Street. Emma said she wasn't feeling well and couldn't talk. He asked her if she wanted a hug, and she retreated with a horrified look on her face. By the late afternoon, two people called police when they saw Emma pacing back and forth on Douglas Street, looking agitated and frightened. Another man reported seeing Emma at the Rock Bay Shelter. What Emma was doing there is uncertain. She refused to stay at Rock Bay because it was co-ed, and in the weeks before she went missing, Emma seemed more and more frightened of men. Between 4 and 6 p.m., Emma was seen twice. A witness who knew her stated that they saw Emma shuffling slowly northward on Douglas Street, away from the shelter, and then later again at the corner of Douglas and Finlayson Street. Emma glanced their way and gave them a sad smile, as if she were holding back tears. Evident like technology, but at 5.54 p.m., Emma returned to 7-Eleven, where she had purchased the prepaid credit card earlier in the day and bought a prepaid cell phone. She had never owned a cell phone before. On the way out of the store, she nervously peered out the window over and over, as if she were afraid to leave the safety of the building. I feel like someone is following me. A car on the hill when I rose, and then drove as I walked by and paused in the street. I feel weird sometimes. I feel like I'm being stalked. The cell phone was never activated. Emma returned to the Sandy Merriman shelter at 6 p.m. and was told by the staff that her mother was on her way. Emma grabbed her bags and flew out the door, never to return. To this day, Shelley doesn't know how the shelter knew she was coming. She hadn't told them. At 6.10 p.m. on the street in front of the shelter, Emma jumped into a cab and asked to go to the airport, but suddenly changed her mind, telling the cabbie that she couldn't afford the fare. Authorities later found that she had $3,000 in her bank account. What's more, she had left her passport, laptop, journals, camera, and recently borrowed library books in her van, all of which she would have needed if she were planning to leave. Instead of leaving, she asked the cab driver if she could just sit in his cab for a while, but then became frightened by his dispatch radio and bolted from the car. Dennis Quay bumped into Emma Filipov standing barefoot near the Empress Hotel at 6.15 p.m. He started walking with her. Dennis had met Emma before at the library, where they had struck up a conversation about Japan, and he had talked to her a couple of times at the Redfish Bluefish restaurant where she worked. But this wasn't the bright-eyed and cheerful Emma he remembered. 
She seemed depressed and disoriented. As she shuffled slowly along, Emma acted paranoid and kept looking around as if someone was following her. Dennis became so concerned that he slipped into a restaurant to call the police. Fifteen minutes later, the police arrived. Dennis left, thinking that Emma was in good hands. The police found Emma standing shoeless in front of the Empress Hotel on Government Street. Emma told them that she was working through some things and was going for a walk. And then she would go to her friend's house. She nodded yes or no to most of the questions and offered no additional information except what she was asked. Unable to find any legal reason to detain her, the police let her walk off barefoot into the rainy Victoria night. That was the last confirmed sighting of Emma Philippoff. Shelley Philippoff landed at Victoria International Airport, grabbed her bag, and flagged a taxi. She arrived at the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter at 11 p.m. Emma wasn't there and hadn't claimed her bed for the night. After conferring together about their mutual concern over Emma's behavior, the shelter supervisor and Shelley decided to call the police. The police arrived, and by midnight on November 29th, Emma was listed as a missing person. Later, authorities discovered Emma's laptop in her van. She wrote the following, a year to the day before she disappeared. To everyone from dead Emma. Hello. I figured someone would be on this computer at some point and will read this. Okay, so I'm dead. Watching dying stars, reviving stars, and dreaming milky dreams, and shadow dancing on your timelines or whatever. Good luck, every heart. I love you. M. On December 2nd, three days after Emma's disappearance, a woman described meeting a girl she thought was Emma at the Inn Harbor in Victoria. Emma gave the woman advice about how to frame a photograph she was taking. The girl told the woman to repeat the name Emma Philippoff three times. The woman also claimed that Emma was smoking, which was something Emma had done in the past, but had supposedly given up. The sighting was never confirmed. Six days after Emma disappeared, the $200 prepaid credit card Emma purchased the day she went missing was used at a Petro-Canada station. A transient man used the card to buy cigarettes. The man claimed that he found the card by the side of the road near the Juan de Fuca Recreation Center and the Galloping Goose Trail in Colwood. The police polygraphed the man and cleared him, although he later admitted to Shelley Philippoff that he was a heavy drinker and that he wasn't sure where he had found the card. On the morning of November 29th, 2012, at around 5 a.m., a man recalled picking up a woman who resembled Emma in Esquimo, B.C. She was soaking wet and wanted to be taken to Colwood to see a friend. Late for work, he dropped her off at the corner of Craig Flower and Admiral Street. He last saw Emma moving in the direction of Colwood. This account was not reported until 2018, however, and would not be followed up on by the Victoria Police Department. After she disappeared, the police found Emma's journals. Later, these journals would be given to Shelley, who still has them to this day. Within those pages, Shelley discovered a stranger who had struggled with mental illness silently and alone. I chased death all my life because I was dead. Sleeping was an escape from all the pain, and stories were the sweet music rain. I love my mom, but I couldn't cause her pain. In the weeks before Emma went missing, many people tried to help her, but she slipped silently through the safety net that was around her. Now, it is Emma's mom, Shelley, who keeps the torch alive. Thanks to Shelley, Emma's case was featured on the Fifth Estate, Canada's version of 2020, in 2014. Shelley has been a guest on numerous podcasts, such as the Nighttime Podcast with Jordan Bonaparte and The Vanished. 
hosted by Marissa Jones. A team of investigators led by Shelley follows up on every tip they get via their Help Find Emma website. In 2018, Shelley and Kimberly Bordage raised funds to pay the expenses for a team of cadaver dogs to search the lakes around Victoria. Nothing was found, and eight years on, the search continues. Our hearts go out to Shelley Philippoff and all the friends and family who keep the memory of Emma. Help us find Emma. If you have any information regarding the whereabouts of Emma Philippoff, please reach out to Shelley Philippoff at the link below this video. If you want to hear more stories of the missing, please like, share, and subscribe. And please support us on Patreon. Thank you for watching. <laughs> but it was so interesting. I'll talk about my piece of it, doing the narration. And Bob knows this a little bit. I played around with different like tones of voice and different styles, and I sent him like recordings of different things. For a while, I I I, I didn't know if I was supposed to read the parts of of Emma Philippoff, right? The, the, yep. I didn't know if I was supposed to read her bits because she has bits in there where they're from like her diaries or her journals, I guess. And, uh, and so I would read it. And so once I read them in like my best female voice, which is, which is kind of like Miss Doubtfire or something, <laughs> I've got a good laugh over that. But, but I tried in various voices and, and just decide, we decided to just kind of use my own voice, but done a little dramatically, I'd say, I'm not sure, but uh, I liked it. And I mean, it, it seemed to fit. And I, I'll probably continue to use that voice for all the future narrations because it just seems to be about right. Um, Bob, um, what, what, so, so you, you decided that with my voice, I can narrate and things. Um, it, it, I'm sure in the process of it, you were going, oh my gosh, is Daryl going to flake out and not do this? Because I did like part of it and then I stopped. And I, so how did you feel about all that? I mean, I, I don't have the inside scoop on that. So uh, I think first, yeah, I picked your voice because the, yeah, just the, the pitch of your voice is really like deep. And like I said, it, well, I'm fine. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Our pitch of your voice is really deep and, uh, I think it kind of draws people in. Yeah. That's, that's, that's why I picked you to do it. Um, yeah. There was times I was getting a little nervous that you were going to finish. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. But he was patient with me and, and we did it. And, uh, uh, and like I say, I've told Bob, um, I feel so much ridiculously more confident than I was when I started the project. So, I think for the next one, I'm going to be able to do it a lot quicker. So I'm not, I, I would be surprised if it took me more than like three or four days to pull off the next one. Where this last one, I don't know. I think it was a month, month and a half. I don't know what it took. Cause, cause I, it took me forever just to, I think it was three weeks before I even felt like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to even attempt this. And then when I attempted it. I did like, I don't know, a third of it, if that, maybe a quarter of it the first time. And then, went at it again I was not delighted with how I did the first time and so I tried to do it better and but it but if you listen to the show you can totally hear that the first part of it I stumble over words and I stumble over things and don't get across concepts as well as I want to and then about a third of the way through it starts getting better and then the last third is even better so um, it, it just is what it is it's our first time through with this at some point I, I don't know if Bob would ever humor me with this, but at some point after we've, if we've done 10 of these and they're going pretty well, I'd probably like to go back and re-record that first one over again 
uh, or at least part of it a little smoother, but that might be something we do six months down the road or a year down the road or who knows or never, but uh, it exists and it's, and I'm not terribly embarrassed of it, but um, uh, the thing, let's, let's talk for a second. Then, then you had the concept of adding pictures to it, uh, illustrations. Um, you, you got that idea again from essentially the bedtime stories podcast that, that you're talking about or the, or the YouTube channel or whatever that you're talking about. Is that right? Yeah, they're, they do a little bit of missing persons, mostly paranormal, um, which I kind of like. It's kind of science fiction and real life. And they have a guy named Mickey Tracana who does the art. And they do the sort of the same thing that I did. I really liked that format. Yeah. And obviously other people seem to like it. I think they've got 570,000 followers now. Right. After three years. Uh, oddly, the person I picked, Anastasia Rodenko. And Bob's being you know, uh, he's being a little modest here. They have 570,000 listeners, right? I believe, Bob, if I'm correct, you have 350,000 listeners now. Is that is that in the ballpark? Probably more like 35 or... <laughs> 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 Subscribers, probably like that's seven. Cool. That's yeah. my point. I was never great at math. So, so yeah, we'll have 35 in the future. Well, the thing is now that we're featuring this on... This is going to be on my podcast. Oh, your listeners will shoot up. I'm mean, assume that 35 is easily going to change to 37 by the I mean, uh, I, I think a couple, couple of things. One is I really appreciate, I understand what it's like when you're nervous about doing something, then you just don't want to do it. You yeah. just keep putting it off. It's like, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And then I appreciate well, you working through it. I would I'll interrupt you there and say, it's not like you don't want to, for me, it wasn't like I don't want to do it. It's like, I really do want to do this. I know it's something I should do. It's good for me. I want, like I told you be earlier before we started filming, um, I, w I would love to be able to do old time radio shows where I read the different parts and things, right? So I thought this is great training for me to do that. But I was uncomfortable doing it. I was, and so that uncomfortableness became overwhelming, it, like an anxiety uh, that, that would like take you over and, and, and you just, you're like, oh, I can sit down. No, I, I, I need to do this other thing. Oh, my wife told me to clean the kitchen. I'll clean the kitchen first. And you just don't actually get to doing it because you, you put up these barriers that stop you from, that, that's from me. But you were saying, you know that in your own experience. Uh, I mean, I think every, anytime you do anything that like, like I try to, to practice drawing and I like playing drums, anytime you know you could fail, you might suck at it, right? Yeah. Right. Like today I was on yoga and I hate yoga. Well, I don't hate it. I'm just bad at it. Actually, I liked it, but I'm terrible at it. Yeah. And so I had the camera off. So I understand like, you know, you, you have to face this fact that you might suck. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And getting through that and thinking, trying to just separate yourself from the outcome and just do it so you can, because you can't get better at it unless you practice. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Even I'll doing. Say, I'll say Bob doesn't know this. The number one thing that helped me through this whole thing was every single time I talked to Bob, he was like, oh, people love what your, your voice, the way it sounds. Uh, this is, I, I really like, the, he'll point out all the positive pieces to what I'm doing. And it made it where, uh, it, it, it made it a lot easier for me to continue and me want to continue for Bob to do this thing. Had Bob come across, I think, after my first recording session piece and said, oh, this is fine, Daryl. We'll use you until we find somebody better. Uh, I would have, you know, had a harder time with that. But he always seemed confident that I could pull this off. In fact, that when I first submitted the first pieces to him after him waiting for weeks and going, is Daryl ever going to actually do this darn thing? Uh, he immediately said, you know, I, I think in bold letters he texted me like, we can do this or you can do this or, you know, it was, it, he was excited because he realized we could pull this off, even though I felt like it wasn't nearly as professional enough as it needed to be. He gave me that energy and that was really nice. So thank you, Bob. Yeah. I think when we did the, I mean, I took your practice piece. I remember you freaking out about that to do the trailer. He's like, what? And I said, it was great. I mean, the, tra the, tra the trailer is great because it's, it's super high action, two minute or a minute or so. Yes. And I thought, yeah, that was, I thought that was awesome. Yeah. I love, I, and I, and I love the trailer. 
and that made me feel more comfortable doing the the actual uh, show. Um, the thing I, I noticed with the trailer, you used, uh, which I didn't know you were going to do, you used um, like rain effect sound, correct, in the trailer. And and I thought, I was thinking, I was listening, I, I like the idea of the, of the rain effect, but I was thinking, it's a little too loud compared to my voice. It drowns me out a little bit. And, and I thought, you know, this is something that Bob, over the course of doing these, is going to get better and better at figuring out, okay, how loud do I want the background to be? Cause he's, cause Bob's got to be doing, figuring out the background, figuring out me, where he's going to put me in the mix, figuring out how often he's going to change the pictures, what he's going to do with the pictures. You'll notice that when he does the, the pictures, sometimes he's, he does that whole Ken Burns thing of zooming in and zooming out and panning across the picture. And, uh, it just really makes it for an interesting and entertaining piece. The other thing is recording this in isolation. I was like, how long is this thing? I, I, I thought, because I, I just felt like it wasn't that much reading I was doing. It's like uh, Bob and I years ago, and he probably, I don't even know if he remembers this, but I mean, I, he will when I mention it, uh, but he, we've never talked about it since, I don't think. But we used to invite over the neighbor kids and we would grab our Viewmaster and <laughs> show it on the screen and we'd sell like popcorn and things to them. <laughs> As, 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 as Bob wrote the script that is on, like, if you do on a Viewmaster when you're on a slide up, it'll say a little sentence or a paragraph about that slide. And he wrote those all in a script. And then he would, I, I'm not sure if he and I both read it or he, I think he just read it. But, but it, it would be an a, a audio visual presentation that he was making. And this is back in 70. <sighs> Three seventy four. I don't know, something like that. So, so he was way ahead of his time. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I totally forgot about that. Yeah, isn't that crazy? But yeah, <laughs> I, I totally remember that, and I loved it. And that's what um, you, you guys you've missed out. You haven't had a friendship with Bob, and I have, and uh, the joy I have gotten from being his friend over the years is just I can't even. I can't even express it. So yeah, like likewise, it's been yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We wouldn't be friends since third grade if we didn't. It wasn't that way. <laughs> exactly. I mean, we and we were tight like from day one. But um, anyway, so the other weird thing is I'm trying to remember that at that town is she turns out she's actually from the same town that Mickey Tricano came from 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 Adavia. Wow. Uh, and I'm trying to, I'm going to look it up. It's like the main town of Madavia. Anyway, yeah, it's got, it was kind of weird. She, Cause she looked up Mickey Tricano and she says, oh, I'm from that same town. Oh, okay. Chichez, yeah, I can't really pronounce it. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. So yeah, it was kind of weird. So that that's how that came about. She's pretty young, but seems she's really nice. I think she's really talented. Yes, definitely. And and the thing is, I mean, you do what you want, but I would be telling her, hey, if you want to try a different style for different shows, feel free to do that. If you get a certain style that you just want to keep on presenting in this style, that's fine too. I mean, I keep it open for her because I know creative people like to have free reign, and so I would give her a lot of a lot of leeway, probably. And then the other thing yeah. is, um, you're telling her to do, the, to try it on computer and things, but that's if she's comfortable with that. I mean, because it could be slower that way for her than, than it is on paper, who knows? So she's got to kind of figure out uh, that style. But I, I do think six was enough. I mean, it's the whole thing, like I, I was saying earlier, I don't think I finished my thought, but um, when I was recording it, I was like, how long is this going to be? I don't, it felt like the whole thing's going to be five minutes long and, and, but it wasn't, it was, uh, it was out. Uh, yeah. 22 minutes or something like that. So, yeah. and what's nice is because we've talked about this before in the podcast that streaming can do in things where they don't have to have a certain length. And so if he, if, if Bob comes up with one and it's a five minute episode and then he has another one that's, an hour episode. I don't think it matters. I think whatever the story needs to get told is what the, the length of this needs to be. And that's my opinion. But do you agree with that, Bob? Oh, totally. I, and this one, I kind of, I, even up to the last minute I was debating 
should I cut this some of the section in the middle out or that we're talking about her last day? Right. That section, I thought, is that long? But maybe the detail is needed because maybe it'll trigger somebody's memory. I could debate it back and forth whether that should go in. I don't think, I think it, to me, it's the perfect length. It's very listenable in one sitting. It's very, and yet I think that piece uh, of, of, of uh, well, the whole thing. I mean, I don't think you spend too much time on any of it. And the last day part, I think, is the most interesting part of the whole thing of just what always happened to her that last day and all these different people's points of view of how they were involved with her last day. I think that's hyper interesting to me. That's that's where I found the most enjoyment. And and she, yeah, it also kind of shows that she was in some serious distress. Right. right. I mean, it's... Um, and the other thing that's odd about that is so many people noticed her on the 28th. Right, right. Of With November. Them, I think they did so much. And so, yeah, it's strange that that day, all of a sudden, everybody remembered exactly what was happening. Or and, then, and then she's just gone. Like, yeah. other than the sighting on the 29th in the middle of the morning, after that, it's just she's fallen off the face of the earth and nobody knows where she went, what happened. Yeah. We're doing a terrible job publicizing this whole thing as we're talking about it. This is just kind of us chatting, which is great. But the actual name of the show that's going to be multiple episodes is what? What is the title of the of your whole? Oh yeah, so the channel is called "But Not Forgotten." But not forgotten. forgotten. I love that title. But not forgotten is so perfect, and it's going to be on a missing person each time. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's an interesting concept. And he has, uh, with the, the girl's mother, Shelly, right? Yep. He's actually had conversations with Shelly about it. And she's had input into uh, changes and things and things that have been added and, and, and so forth. And I think that's delightful. I doubt each time that he's going to be able to get a hold of somebody uh, or not, but I think for this one that was wonderful that he was able to get a hold of her. I'm hoping that, I mean, the, the, my hope is because there's another lady called Marissa Jones who does a podcast called The Vanished, and she does people that don't get a lot of coverage, and she, people just fill out a form uh -huh. on her site, and then she, she started off with pretty much conventional cases because I think the hopefully the same thing will happen is people start submitting a form and then we can interview them. Okay. I think at the beginning, we'd have to use some stuff that's already out there just because we don't have a lot of coverage yet. Right. Um, well, also, yeah. things that are out there, I think you can collect them easier and put together a show than in an interview. You're going to have to figure out how to interview. That's going to be a whole other skill of pulling out the information and putting it in to a way that's entertaining to present it. Uh, yeah, it's, it, I, I think that'll be difficult, but I bet you can manage it, so. Yeah, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna be a skill for sure. And yeah. I don't know at what, what point we'll, ha we'll have enough visibility where that will happen. Right. Um, there, there's tons of cases that, uh, you know, the statistics are staring. There's like 5,000 a year. Yeah. There's like 60,000 or 800,000 people that go missing in the U.S. in a year, and about 5% of them just are never found. I mean, right. I don't think people realize, you know, I think... But I assume a lot of them just, just uh, have, for their own choices or whatever, just wanted a do-over because something's going crazy in their life or whatever and just leave and, and establish themselves somewhere else and don't tell anybody. Am I right with that, or or is that just? Kind of I mean, that that happens, but they don't know since they don't know where they're at. They just they just don't. I mean, that I know that has happened, right? Because I think if you watch the Fifth Estate episode, where another thing about Shelley, if I was missing, Shelley Philip would be one person I would want behind me because she's just relentless. Yeah, and trying to find Emma. Okay. Um, if you look at the Fifth Estate episode, I mean, they talk about a few cases like that mm -hmm. where people like one guy who came to the United States and 50 years later, he comes back to Canada. But since they never, if they don't find a body or anything, they don't know. You just don't know what well, happened to him. Think, 
like in 19, from the beginning of time until say the year 2005 or something, if you wanted to disappear and you left and you just never told anybody where you were, it would probably be relatively hard to find you. But I would think now with the internet and everything, you could be searching and, and have folks search for their, uh, certainly if, if their credit card's been used, certainly if uh, uh, they've got a new job and they've used their social security number, um, I would think it'd be easier finding people now with the whole internet and the phones and the, the you know, the, they didn't turn off their location feature, you can probably find them that way. So, so I would think it'd be harder to disappear now than it's ever been. Yeah, I mean, you'd think you'd think that with all the cameras and tracking. Yeah. And, but I, I was watching this thing with a guy named Mike Arnfield, who's a detective, uh, and now he does his own. He used to be a cop in England, and he said there's actually we're actually solving less cases now. Weird. Because did part of it's the he, part of it's the that he thinks that is part of it's volume. Okay. But just so many cases that they just don't have the time to do to to you know resources into it. Yeah. yeah and it there, there's another uh, friend of emma's actually made a comment about she can't believe people still go missing you know we have cell phones we've got all these surveillance cameras and she says at the end that we're just people that love the person that's missing we're just lost in this huge country of ours it's like even with all that people somehow slip through the grid and yeah right. that's yeah I know you kind of feel like a person that went and jumped off a bridge. You'd see uh, surveillance video from different stores and different things where you can see, oh, here they were a mile away from the bridge. Now here they are half a mile away from the bridge. Oh, here's footage from the bridge cams that show them jumping or whatever. And you'd go, okay, well, we know exactly what happened to this person, even though we've never found their body or whatever. But I guess that doesn't happen nearly as much as you would think it would. So Yeah, they just, like, even Emma, like, they have her on surveillance the last day. After that, there's no, she was obviously headed to Colwood. Yeah. Where did she go? She just disappeared from the face of the earth. Yeah. So, yeah. And so you kind of assume in those cases, unfortunately, that there's some sort of foul play that happened uh, because that person has never been seen again. So you're like, okay, well, something happened to them. Yeah. yeah, you don't know. Like, I'm thinking of like Chris McCandless, who was the, John Cracker wrote that book, Into the Wild, about him. He's the guy that went to Alaska and he disappeared off the face of the earth for two years mm -hmm. and was untrackable, no cell phone. He, he renamed himself Ale Alexander Super Tramp. A Super Tramp is somebody who's a tramp, but has a car. Okay. And he just lived off the grid, threw away his money, his credit cards, and just went, yeah, would sleep in his car and hang out. Eventually, he tried, went into Alaska um, and ended up dying in his bus because he got, caught, got stuck. But anyway, yeah, people do all sorts of things. Well, and having said this, it shows my lack of attention and things because I got sidetracked with you saying what a super tramp was. So, <laughs> so, so, the, so, so a super tramp is a, someone who has a, is a, a vagrant or whatever that has a car. Yeah. In their car. Was that when the band super tramp created the name, did they, was it in existence then that, that, that was what the band is named after is somebody who's, who's a tramp but has a car and can travel around? That's a good question. I don't know. I should look okay. it up. Huh. Yeah. He, uh, yeah. So this is why I invite Bob to our show because <laughs> he shares something every time that's like, oh, that's an interesting piece of, we can spend a whole show talking about what a super tramp is. <laughs> so, so maybe Emma became a super tramp or yeah. uh, probably not a super tramp because she left her van, but maybe yeah. she, she, she's one person that I could see could actually slip off the grid. I, yeah. I could see her. She was, kind of almost homeless at the point that she disappeared anyway. Right. And yet so, she's somewhat self-sufficient, so she might be able to pull this off, you're saying. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. And, and uh, I, I guess we'll, uh, if you're okay, 
Can we talk about the second episode that's not aired yet, but had some information that came out and things? Are you okay if we talk about that, or do you not want to talk about that? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, we can talk so, about it. So, so as I'm being nervous wreck and recording the first episode in the midst of that bob gets a second episode going and you and decides well daryl's such a basket case i can't really use him right now and he's in the middle of recording the first one anyway so so he uses uh, another person uh, a, a female who actually is the girl is the person who does emma's part in yeah cassandra hooper cassandra hooper so she so she does the second episode narrative but in the production of the second episode, during the production or after the production, I guess, before he airs it, um, unfortunately, uh, maybe you can fill us in on what, what the new information that you got and, and when you got it. Was it just this week that you heard about it? or? Yeah, so me and Kat, who's the editor, decided this one was a little different. We, were gonna use, we actually used live pictures because she'd been missing just since August of this year, and we wanted to crank it out. And then we'd go back as the case progressed, we'd go back and put the art back in. So, and you were still working on episode one. And I said, let's just crank this out really fast. And so I asked Cassandra to do it. Fortunately, I actually left a whole page of the narration out. (laughs) But I sent her. So I was going to have it out last Sunday. uh, And then it turned out they found her body. So her name is Cassandra Cottrell. She was three months pregnant. She disappeared. They found her car. Um, so that episode was almost done. And then Wednesday, they found her body in a ravine. Right. And they had tracked her. They found, speaking of surveillance cam, they found her, saw her boyfriend leave her car and get into his truck. So they used the GPS on his, he had like one of the OnStar or something, one of those yeah. things. Right. So they tracked him, and that's how they found the body. So unfortunately, she didn't. Yeah, she passed away. So I think we're still going to air the episode, but probably put an addendum on it, just in case somebody knows something that might help the police. Or right, right. Yeah, right. pretty but sad actually. Think, it is sad, um, and I, but I would assume, you know, kind of unfortunately in a way. That this is going to be a, a, a rarity that, that a case is like solved before you, because a lot of these cases could be years until they find anything or any clues or anything. In this case, the case is solved, but not the way anyone would desire it to be solved. Um, but I do think it's important that you do air it still. I'm just curious, uh, how long did that episode end up being? Uh, it's only like and we cut clips from, I guess, from the Fair Use Act allows us to use clips from news stations. It's about six minutes. Okay. It yeah. was supposed to be like, just get it out there because they're looking for her. Yeah. And I really struggle with not having the, because it didn't like have the format I wanted. I, I like to have the art in it. But yeah. I know if we did that, we'd probably take two or three weeks to do it. Yeah. I'd so say turn- point, especially since it's been solved, just put it out there and do the art for the next one. But yep. also, I, I, it's interesting. I feel like, in my opinion, um, you know, if you want to get more episodes out there, sometimes using art, sometimes if it's a recent case that you have enough pictures of and things to do that, it would also give different episodes a different flavor. So, and, and let you increase production quite a bit, I would think. Especially like if you did every other episode that had, had, illustrations and every other episode had photographic sort of stuff um or even like you say news clips tied in i mean it could be really interesting and and i think keeping the diversity of it would make your audience tune in more and 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 not feel like oh this is old hat i've i've seen enough of these i'm not going to watch anymore i think it would be uh keeping them engaged maybe um what are your thoughts on that yeah, I'm struggling with that because obviously having the images really stretches out the production time. Yes. But I'm so like in love with bedtime stories. I mean, I, when I first found that channel, yeah. I watched, I swear, I, I like binged watched, you know, a hundred episodes or something. And then I got to the point where I was caught up. Now I got to wait every week or two, a couple weeks. Mm-hmm. So I was really connected to that which i got how long has that been in production you know 
it started uh, 2017. Uh, and the art is totally approved, or Mickey's approved a ton in, in three years. Obviously, because he's consistently working every week, right? Yeah. I'm sure he's gotten faster. His artwork has gotten better. Yeah. If you look at their first episode, it's, yeah. So I'm kind of struggling with that, but I think that might be something that we have to do just to get the, get more coverage. Could be. I mean, because the, the upside is you can do it faster. The upside is that you'd have more variety of, I feel like more variety because you don't know what you're getting at each episode. Oh, this one we're going to get pick real photographs of this one. We're going to get illustrations. What are we getting? Um, on the downside, you lose the consistency episode to episode and, and having your like an identity for your show. So I could definitely see arguments to both sides. Uh, I could also see that maybe early on you feature more of that and maybe as you bump into more artists and or because either either she's gonna either she's gonna have to up her rate of how many pictures she can get to you which i think is you know questionable how much faster she's gonna get uh or you use multiple artists and i think that is the probably one of the easier ways to go and maybe having it out there i would assume there's some artists that could go oh I can do six or seven pictures for you in, you know, a week's time frame or whatever. And if you once if you had three artists working with you, you could definitely they could probably be getting you stuff as fast as you wanted it because you you can only produce so many of these shows every few weeks anyway. So, I mean, I, it, if you if you had me doing the narration as fast as humanly possible, and you had other things going. How many shows do you think you could actually feasibly produce in a month? I mean, I like to do two a month. Yeah. See, I don't think you could do it weekly. I think that I think no, like it's, a couple it's, of months is the most you could get out anyway. And you know what actually takes a lot of time, which you think wouldn't be that big of a deal, yeah. is like when your narration's done, I'm going, oh, because we have the text up there, right? Right. I go, oh, the text went away before he was done. Oh, I got to stretch that out. Then I'm um, on to the next the next thing that he's read. Oh, I got to shorten that or make it longer. That, that actually takes a ton of time. How do you do, do you, do you, uh, is there in, in the editing stuff, is there something that lets you lengthen it or are you just adding frames and just saying, okay, I need 20 more frames of this or I don't know. No, the tool is actually pretty cool. So I basically go in and list a donation and then I, I know where it's, I just hit stop yeah. where you're done. And then, I you have to note the time because if I don't, when I click on the, it looks like a little, like, I don't want to click a schedule chart. Yeah. It's all laid out in time. Right. Oh, it stopped there to 22 seconds, frame 14. And then I just stretch it out and drop it. Okay. Huh. And what, what program are you using for the editing? Uh, uh Cyberlink, uh, Pro 60, 365. It's like one of those yearly subscription things. I haven't found anything that it can't do yet. Okay. Um, yeah, it was one of the ones that was got high ratings. Right. I haven't even scratched really the service of the things that it can do. Correct. And, and there's a, a few out there that I've downloaded that, that do various things, but they're all, my brain is not very good. So, so they're, is, they're all too complicated for me. So I just went back and started using um windows movie maker which is about the most simple one you can do and and that one I'm, i decided i'm going to get used to that and get proficient with that and then when i need to be able to do something it can't do i'll use something else but um yeah it's a little it's a little tricky getting out how to use all these things like the thing i'm stumbling across right now is i would like to in some of my shows put like uh, audio you know a half hour audio show on the end of my video but when i try to do that it puts it over the top like it put it over the top of us talking it won't put it at the end because it has no video to go with it so it's assuming i, I want to supplant it on top of this and so we'd be talking and you'd hear background talking or whatever it is i got to figure out a way to say no no i want it to go at the end of this even though if it has no video with it just show black screen for now and then i could drop in video i would think but this one, yeah, you could do it totally easy. This tool, you just go, you add it to the library, this audio link, and then you just drop it into one audio track and just move it to the end. Yeah, yeah. 
it's so it's there you can link the video and the audio together but you can also have them separate yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what i need to figure out is how to do that piece and i don't know if you can do that with movie maker or not i assume you can and i'll probably just need to figure it out but anyway um what else let's see so you so you got her so who all do you, why don't you go through all the different people you have involved in this production. So you've got me doing the narration. Yep. You're sort of the director, producer, whatever you want to call it. Video and editor. You've the, and you've got um, what's what's the what's the name of your artist again? Anastasia Rudenko. Okay, and so you've got her doing doing the pictures, and then who are the other people involved? So Paul uh, P J Hudson. Paul Hudson did the of uh, all the music. So it's all the music too. That's true. Yeah, he did. I asked him because I played in a band with him. I and he's a writer, so I said, "Hey, can you do this?" And he, I really like the theme song work he did. So I have a bunch of tracks that he's produced. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, oh, there was you, and there's Cassandra who did the voice of Emma. Yeah. And the narration on the second one, Cassandra Hooper. And then there's Kat Turner, who somebody I work with in a writing class way back. Right. Um, so I asked her to do some editing because sometimes I'm kind of wordy and my sentence structure's not always that awesome. So she cleaned up a bunch of this episode. My favorites of your writing is how you can have sometimes in the same uh, paragraph have things in like future tense, back to past tense, into past tense. <laughs> And so narrating it is just a joy when that happens. <laughs> walked, off, we... She walked in some place, then he had already gone to the, and it's, it's like past. <laughs> Hopefully we can oh, fix it. We'll be more careful with that maybe yeah. next time. But it, it, it's just fun being, part, seeing something getting created, seeing something new. And the fact that it, it it's so stupid, but it gives me kind of sympathy for Gene Roddenberry as he's doing the original Star Trek with the, the writers. With the, you start to see how complicated this all gets, and uh, and for you, it's it's on a much much smaller scale. But it's but it's a headache for you to put all this together, and you think about the folks that are doing actual television shows and things, and how incredibly co how complicated that must get. Now they can hire, you know, they say, oh, I need an assistant, I need this, I need that. You know, and you can't hire all these people. You got to find these people that are willing to do things for free, but uh, it, it's crazy. Um, is it, did you find it, if you look back to what you were thinking before, I don't know if you can do this, but it, was it more complicated than you thought it would be about what you thought it would be or less complicated than you thought it would be? I think probably more, like you said, I can't imagine what it'd be like doing a TV show. Oh, that prop is not on the, on the, you know, all those props, everything's got to be in place. Right. It must be just this huge, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure they refined it over the years, this like huge sort of logistical thing right. that, um, but yeah, part of the, doing the project was just trying to create a little community. Right. So I'm hoping uh, more people come over, but yeah, it was, there's definitely a lot of complication in terms of like, you know, I would have done things different. Like I would make sure the narration was done before I started moving stuff around. Cause then when the narration came in, then like I said, I had to move all the, all the, yeah, all the text around. Then I find over that overlaps with some other piece I put here that, yeah, anyway. Yeah. I, well, and you wouldn't uh, hire this flaky narrator that you did. I mean, my gosh, the guy was, I don't, basket case. So it's I, like no, I don't think it, you were a basket <laughs> case. I think actually, I turned it. I think it turned out great. I mean, you actually didn't de really delay it that much. I mean, because I was still working on stuff throughout. Yeah, I knew that piece, so I went. I didn't feel too bad about it until the very end. I was like, okay, I got to get this done. Uh, I think when, when I got the rain now, rain animation done, that was another thing I learned is how to do some simple animation. Right. Um, then I'm thinking, oh, we probably should get this narration done. Up to that point, I was still like doing stuff. 
And then it was so fun for me. Uh, the most fun I had was when I texted you. I'm like, supposed to be punching in like words that I mispronounced, like the names of he. There's tons of names of locations, and they're all bizarre. Even his people. What? Uh, where did all these people come up with these crazy names? But there's there's names of all the people that are tough to say too. And so I'm like, okay, I need to talk to Bob to make sure I'm pronouncing things right. And so I I text him and ask if we can get onto a Zoom. And this is, I don't know, what was it, 11 o'clock at night or something that we got on? It was like closer to like midnight. Almost yeah, midnight. and then we stayed on until, I don't know, two or something working on this thing. But it was hilarious and it was fun. And I love that piece of it. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that was because we were so like tired and giddy. We yeah. kept, kept, kept laughing and like. Well, well that's, we kind of do that. But <laughs> we enjoyed it. It was fun to do that. And it made me think. Uh, you know, this is something eventually where we might decide that, that we want you to be there when I'm recording narration to kind of in real time say, oh, try that again or let's do, let's do this. I mean, because certainly that's what they do in the studio when they're recording somebody. Actually, that would, I think be, that and would be fun. It kind of worked because I would just have him mute himself and then I would record the piece and then he would unmute himself and we do that. Now, I do think... Um, because we were doing it over Zoom, that well, was I recording over Zoom or was I recording? No, I wasn't recording over Zoom. I don't think we were on Zoom. Yeah, and then you were. But I was actually had the had my audio thing up so that the sound quality was better because Zoom only records in a certain sound quality and it's not of the quality we really want for just an audio show. I mean. It's fine for, for us doing the intros and things, but you wouldn't want it for uh, for strictly doing something audio. So yeah, and, and that was that was fun. So we'll yeah. have to, we, I'm happy to do it that way again at some point. I have a feeling at the end of projects, we might need to do that little punch up at the end to fix some things and, and I need you I'm, to talk to you, so. I'm, I'm hoping that we can like maybe probably get together at the beginning too. Yeah. To yeah. go over the pronunciation because it's, Cutting it in was not super hard, but sometimes like, oh, the pitch is slightly different or the volume is slightly different. You got to adjust the volume. Yeah. Right. And yeah, I think. Well, would, my voice, I change the way I use my voice all the time so much that it, it sometimes isn't of the same. I mean, you don't want it to be, they were visiting Spokane and then they, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And it makes it makes even as hard as I tried. There's I know they're there, right? I think right. that they stick out to me because I know they're there. But yeah. it's yeah, trying to make it perfect. I listened and it wasn't bad. The whole, there was like one word that stuck out to me that, that we probably should have redone. But uh, but I think, like you said before, I think it's better if I redo like a whole sentence instead of just a word because then it kind of fits in better and I can kind of. Play with it. Yeah. Hopefully, if I do a better job with the script, right. and they, then they went to Spokane instead of then they went to Spokane. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. and then like try to change the pitch, just the pitch, just yeah. the volume. So, volume. so it, yeah. Hopefully, because yeah, I I, you can't expect people to say the same way every time. No, no, and 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 I'll, I'll try to get better with that. Um, I'm just trying to think, is there anything else I want to cover with this? I think we covered the ground pretty well. I'm excited to keep doing it. I think it's a great project. I think it's interesting. I think it's a rarity in that it's a, a, a creative outlet, a fun thing for us all to do, and yet something that might actually help someone get found, that might actually help solve a, a bigger problem than all of us. And if that ever happens through something we do, that would be just... Phenomenal. Yeah, because there's so many, like, I mean, if you look at Shelly, yeah. she's like, her life is just not the same. Right, right. I mean, her, her life is pretty much get up, find Emma, go to bed, get up, find Emma. I mean, it, this is really, I, I remember a quote, from, well, a couple of things. One is like Mother's Day, I always think of her because she yeah. doesn't have Emma back. The other quote was her, was she, I don't know, from some podcast, it might have been The Vanished. She said, I used to love that feeling of my kids all being home and safe. Right. And obviously now she doesn't have that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard if your kids get older and get out on their, cause you, you feel like when they're in your house, you have control 
But when they're out living in the world, you don't know what they're going to run into or what situations are going to happen to them. Um, it's a scary thing when you have kids and, and you realize that. My kids are just old enough now that they're starting to get out there. One's 20, one's 22. And, uh, and you just don't know. You, you hope for the best for them and, and never want to hear anything horrible or scary. I, I, you just never know. And I'm always like kind of freaked out when Laura drives up from Portland and she leaves really late and she's driving at one in the morning. That yeah. freaks me out. And it's kind of like, you know, she's an adult. Yeah. But you're, they're still your kids. And Emma was 26, but she was still Shelly's kid. They're always going to be your kids. They, they can be, well, now I'm, you know, I'm my dad and my mom's kid and I come visit them and, and I'm 56. And so they're, I'm still their kid. Um, the, how old are your kids now? See, Dr. Laura was 27. Jimmy's 25. Okay. Yeah. It's so interesting how age works in that, let's say, let's take our kids, for example. The, when your kids were, you know, teenagers, they wouldn't have wanted to be around my kids at all because my kids would have been little guys, right? Eight, seven, six, whatever. Uh, but now they're all adults, all of them. I mean, 20, the young, mine being 20 and yours oldest being 27 ish, uh, that you can see them all become friends and things. It, it's, it's, it all kind of equalizes out once everybody reaches, um, you know, 18 or, or above, you can, uh, converse more and have more in common and things. And so, um, my kids have friends that are quite a bit old, 10 years older than them and five years younger than them. And yeah, and so it's, it's just interesting how time works out that way. Um, anyway, I think we've gone along enough, probably. Um, any, anything else you want to tell them or uh, how to find yeah. episodes or whatever they go, they go to you, they go to YouTube and, and what hit. You tell you be tired, but not forgotten. And Emma, because I put that in the tag. I mean, that's just our first episode, but that'll take you to at least that video. Yeah, because I um, tried, but not forgotten. And you only have one video, so it so it grabs onto other things. Yeah, four years. But I think you've used the word Emma, and so and how do you spell her? It's E M M A. E M M A. Okay. And yes, yeah, subscribe and like us, because the more people that get to the site, the more the people that see it. So we have lots of subscribers, people can see it in the search and then people will, will see these cases and hopefully yeah. somebody will, somebody will know something. That's okay. the hope anyway. And while you uh, watch the one episode that we have out, after you watch that, you might want to go over and catch, if you liked it, you might want to go over and catch those bedtime stories episodes because they have a lot more out you can watch and just keep on tuning back to us when we get a new episode out there. Yeah. I love bedtime stories. So I can definitely give a plug in for those guys. Actually, I'd like to meet those guys. Uh, they're, yeah. they're British, which is kind of gives it a kind of a cool accent. Now, do, do most of their cases they talk about, I mean, are they, they're not, some of them are missing persons or are they not missing persons? Oh, no, they do. They done a couple missing, but they did uh, the Lost Girls of Panama, uh, Chris Kramers and uh, Lizanna Froon. Most of them are like the last one was on UFOs. They do Bigfoot. Okay. Good they good. do. Uh, yeah. Just mostly paranormal and mystery. Right. But that's seriously entertaining. At least I find it entertaining. Okay. And then how long are their episodes? Usually a half hour ish or. Uh, in the 20 minute range. They're not super long. 20, 25. So kind of like your length of, of the episode you released. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, anyway, congratulations with this, Bob. Really cool. Yep. Idea. Um, Th thanks thank thanks for the narration. Oh yeah. You're so welcome. And, uh, thank you for, uh, let me do this, uh, podcast piece about it and then feature. I appreciate it. it. Yeah. It helps. Yeah, well, do what I can, and hopefully you'll see your numbers spike way up there in the millions from all my listeners. So, <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> but we shall see. So anyway, uh, we'll tune in uh, next time for you guys. I know this is a strange kind of one to have on the science fiction podcast that we do, but I thought it tied in well enough that uh, with, with Bob doing it and me doing it that you'd want to hear about it. Um, I'm probably going to – you're probably hearing this if you're listening to this – probably on all my podcasts. I'll probably put it on all of them and then uh, see what happens from there. So thank you. And uh, 
email me or whatever if you want me to keep presenting these on my podcast so that he comes up with new episodes or not. I don't know what we'll do, but we'll see. Thanks, everybody.